he has been born, and we don't know so much about him. He has been known as the father of free software, he the father, uh, founder of the free software foundation, and also you know the initiator of the GNU pro project. And uh, is well known for many, many, many software achievements, and also received multiple awards in the past. And uh, Richard has been here before. He was here la last year in November uh, 2004. And it's our pleasure to welcome him back here again and give us his speech on free software and software business. Thank you. Thank you. I think I will start by telling with the part of my speech that is not controversial. <laughs> Why software patents are a horrible thing to do. The most important thing to know about patents is that each patent is a monopoly on using some technique or method or idea, and nobody's allowed to do to use that idea. And when patents are applied to the software field, this means a software technique or a feature or an algorithm is a monopoly an artificial monopoly for 20 years. What does that do to software developers and users? What it means is that they are going to get sued. If you look at a large program, you will find thousands of different techniques, features, ideas, and so on. In a country that permits these to be patented, out of those thousands of techniques, features, and ideas, hundreds of them will be patented. And that means this large program will probably infringe hundreds of patents at once. And the developers of this program will be facing hundreds of potential lawsuits in parallel. And so will the users, because the users can be sued also. It's vital to understand that patent law is nothing like copyright law. Their practical requirements on the public are completely different. It's the practical requirements that they impose on the public that have the effects. Copyright is a restriction on copying a specific work, and it covers the details of expression of that work. So. For instance, if you write a novel, you don't have to be afraid that some stranger can sue you for copyright infringement because you know you didn't copy it. And as long as you didn't copy it, you're not infringing copyright. But that's not the case for patents because every patent covers a, a somewhat general technique or feature. And as you write something, a program or a novel, of course you're using, you're implementing various ideas. Well, those ideas could be patented and you don't even know it. There's no way you can keep track because there are hundreds of thousands of software patents. Once a country starts allowing software patents, it ends up with hundreds of thousands of them. There's no way to keep track. And the crucial point is you can get sued for a combination of things that you thought of on your own, and it doesn't matter that you thought of them on your own. You're going to get sued anyway. <clears throat> so let's look at what it is like if you are in a country that allows software patents and you want to actually work with the patent system as you develop a program. What are you going to do? Well, the first step would be to find all the patents that might restrict the program you're developing. You might think, first I'll identify all the ideas in my program, and then I'll see which of them are patented already. Practically speaking, you can't do that. And the reason is, you can't see all the ideas that others would see in your program. Once you start looking at a problem in a particular mental structure, it's hard for you to recognize a different mental structure 
that could be used to, to structure the same thing. So imagine that there were graphical art patterns. Yes, okay. And suppose you put a square into mm -hmm. your drawing. And someone had a patent on bottom edges. Well, a square has a bottom edge, so you would get sued for the bottom edge of that square. But, not only that, someone looking at your, draw at your drawing on a slant, suppose you turned it on a slant, now that square becomes a diamond and it has a bottom corner. Well, maybe someone else has a patent on bottom corners. So all he has to do is turn your drawing by 45 degrees, and he says, you've got a bottom corner, I'm going to sue you. Now, if you're used to looking at your drawing the right side up, you're not going to notice what it looks like on a slant. You just won't think of it. So if you try to list what are all the things I might get sued for for this drawing, you wouldn't notice the bottom corner. But, but when the patent holder goes to court, all he has to do is say, look at it this way. Now you see it has, it has something that, this, that fits the description in my patents. And that's enough for you to lose. So you can't list all the ideas in the program, even after you've written it. You won't see all the different ways of describing what those same lines of code do. Because you only see the way you thought of it. But you might think, well, I can't list all the ideas in this program, but maybe I can find all the patents that might prohibit this program. Well, you can't do that. And the reason is that patent applications are kept secret by the patent office. How long depends on the country, but it's always at least a year and a half. So there could be a patent application being considered that might result in a patent issuing tomorrow or six months from now or a year from now. And when that happens, you can get sued. But you can't find it out now. This is not just theoretical. It's happened to programs that I've had to work with like a compressed program, a data compression program. It was written in 1984 using the LZW data compression algorithm. The author found this in an article in a journal. And foolish him, he thought the purpose of computer science journals was to publish algorithms that people could use. So he used this algorithm. He implemented a program. And at the time, there was no patent on it. The patent was issued in 1985. The patent holder did not immediately start threatening people using Compress. The patent holder was cunning and thought, we'll, what, we'll give them a few more years to dig their graves deeper, and then we'll start threatening them when they've invested so much they can't escape. So, in the late 90s, I started asking who could provide another data compression program with another algorithm. And someone offered us one. He said, I've been developing this for a year and a half, and uh, I decided to donate it to the GNU project. We were about a week away from releasing that program when a patent was issued covering that algorithm. Well. That program died before it was born. But it could have been worse. We could have released it, and six months later, a patent could have issued. That would have been really sad. <clears throat> so eventually, we developed another algorithm, which is the basis of the program GZIP, which is more or less the standard way of compressing files for everybody in the world. <clears throat> And it compresses better, it runs faster, and it is not patented. So that sounds like a happy ending, but I'll tell you more about it later. So, so you can see in one narrow subfield, we, we had this problem twice in a row. It must be happening fairly often. So you might 
So you can't find out all, about all the patents that are going to restrict your program. But at least you can find out all the issued patents, because those are published by the patent office. So at least in theory, you could get the whole stack and study them all. But there are hundreds of thousands, so you can't do it. It would be more, much more time than you could ever do. So you're going to have to search for the relevant ones. And you'll find plenty, but you won't find them all. For instance, there was a software patent in the US covering natural order recalculation in spreadsheets. This just means it recalculates each cell after the cells it depends on. So that after one pass of recalculating, everything is consistent. The earliest spreadsheets did the recalculation top to bottom because it was simpler and they ran in very small computers and they had to save memory. They didn't have room to implement natural order recalculation. And then a few years later, computers were bigger, so they did. Anyway, somebody once asked me for a copy of that patent. I looked up the number in our files. I pulled out that patent. I copied it. I mailed it. And a week later, she said, I think you sent me the wrong patent. This is something about compiling formulas into object code. So I looked it up, I pulled out that patent, and yeah, that's the title. A method for compiling formulas into object code. So I thought, what happened? Did we put the wrong patent number in our file? I started reading it. And yeah, it was the natural order recalculation patent. But it didn't mention the word spreadsheet. It didn't mention the term natural order recalculation. The patent actually covers an algorithm called topological sorting. But it didn't mention the term topological sorting. If you had been searching for patents relevant to spreadsheets, you would not have found this one. You would only have heard about it if somebody else told you he was getting sued. <laughs> and they were. Spreadsheet developers were sued with that patent. So, your search will not find all the relevant patents, but it will find a lot of them. So what then? You're going to have to study these patents and figure out what each one prohibits. That's not easy to tell. Because patents are written in twisted legal language, which is very hard to understand. The words don't mean what you think they mean. You're going to have to spend a lot of time with a lawyer figuring out what you're not allowed to do. It's not straightforward to tell. A couple of years ago, Kodak sued Sun for patent infringement. And the patent is almost impossible to understand. Nobody can tell what that patent covers and what it doesn't. And Sun thought it would win the case on the grounds that it, what it was doing was not covered by the patent and it lost instead. I mean, who knows? You're taking a chance all the time. The lawyer, after, after you spent a lot of time describing various things you might want to implement and talking with, to, to the lawyer, the lawyer will eventually tell you something like, uh, if you do something in this region, you're probably going to lose the lawsuit. If you do something in this region, there's a substantial chance you'll lose. And if you really want to be safe, you've got to stay out of this region. So now that you have clear rules for how you're allowed to do business, what are you actually going to do? Well, there are three options for each patent, three things you can try to do. And each of them may or may not be possible in any given case. One is avoid the patent. Another is get a license to use the patent. And the third one is invalidate the patent. Each of them may work or may not. By the way, if you are carrying a portable tracking and surveillance device, <laughs> please switch it off. They have already tracked you here. <laughs> they already know you're listening to me. So you don't have to keep it on now. So, 
What about avoiding the pattern? That means don't use the algorithm. Don't implement that feature. Well, this may be possible, it may not. Consider the LZW data compression algorithm. Well, in, in the domain of compressing files, we avoided that pattern. We found a better compression algorithm. It runs faster, it produces smaller compressed files, and everybody switched to it. Sounds like a great solution, right? But the same algorithm is used in PostScript. The PostScript specification says there is an operator to do LZW compression and an operator to do LZW uncompression. We couldn't solve this problem by substituting a better algorithm. It was not compatible. It would not have implemented the PostScript spec. Well, we got lucky. It turns out that both of the patents on LZW, you see, this is an algorithm that has been patented twice, the same thing, patented twice. I'll tell you more about that in a little bit. But both of them were written in such a way that if all your system can do is uncompress, it's not covered. The patents cover uncompression, but only in a machine that also does compression. And it turns out, people don't normally ask their printers to compress anything. They ask their printers to uncompress. So, we couldn't fully implement PostScript, but we could implement the uncompression alone. And that turns out to be enough for the users to be satisfied, even though it doesn't fully meet the spec. So that was a narrow escape. But, the same algorithm, LZW, is used in making GIF files. So we couldn't make any software to produce GIF files. It didn't take long for somebody to develop an alternative image format called PING for PING's not GIF. <laughs> and we said to people, stop using GIF, switch to PING. And the users said, uh, well, maybe we'll do it someday, but the browsers don't support it. And the browser developer said, well, maybe we'll do it someday, but the users aren't demanding it. <laughs> the problem is, GIF was a de facto standard. There are lots of GIF images on the web. And these people, they weren't thinking, I want to compress my image, how can I do that? No, they were thinking, I want to publish an image in a format that works on the web, in a format that other people use. It's very hard to convince people to change a de facto standard. It would be like trying to convince everyone in Malaysia to switch to speaking Russian. I mean, <laughs> who would want to be first? So we never got them to change. More by 15 years of urging people to change, they didn't. We even had Bernal Gifts Day, and they didn't. <laughs> well, we used to think that JPEG format, at least, was a safe alternative. And then somebody, about three, or three years ago or so, discovered he had a patent covering JPEG. Now, JPEG is not a de facto standard. It's an official standard issued by a standards committee. The standards committee had a lawyer look at the patents and he says he thinks the patent does not actually cover JPEG. So who's right? There's a court case going on. It'll tell us who's right. Because, you know, the patents are so hard to understand. It's, to some extent, just a matter of it's just a judgment call. Does the patent really prohibit this or not? But these are fairly easy problem situations. JPEG may be covered by one patent. GIF was covered by two patents. These two patents cover the exact same algorithm. Now, how did that happen? It's not supposed to ever happen. They're not supposed to issue two patents for the same thing. But they can't help it. 
You see, patent office employees, like the patent examiners, are under pressure to get to, to move the work through. They're not supposed to think at very deeply and at great length about what they're doing. They don't have time to check all the other patent applications for something that might, in fact, cover the same algorithm. They can only check for other applications that look similar. But you know, in mathematics, and this really is just mathematics, you can formulate the same calculation in different ways that look very different. And the only way to tell that they're really the same is to think about them carefully. Now, these patent examiners are not stupid, but they don't have time to take this application and each other possibly relevant similar application and one by one think about them carefully. And that might take them weeks. And they have to move the job through. They have, it was 17 hours on the average per application. No time for careful thinking. So these mistakes happen over and over. Remember that second data compression algorithm, the program that died a week before it was born? Well, that algorithm was patented twice also. So it must happen pretty often. So these are pretty light cases, one or two patents covering a standard. Now look at MPEG-2. I saw a list which included 39 different US patents, all supposedly covering various, each one some aspect of MPEG-2. The negotiations about how someone could license all these patents took longer than the development of the standard. The JPEG standard committee is trying to release a new version of the JPEG standard, and they say they're stymied. It's impossible to, to thread their way around all these patents. There's no way to make a standard for that. And what's the use of standards if people are not allowed to implement them? <clears throat> so avoiding patents is sometimes possible and sometimes not. You know, could you avoid the natural water recalculation patent? Maybe, but people would have said your spreadsheet was crap. If you look at a word processor, you'll find hundreds of different features. A word processor today. Well, if, suppose you were told well, you can't have this feature, you can't have that feature, you can't have that feature, and one by one you would uh, take out features. Well, you know, one if maybe after the first five features were gone. If they were not particularly important features, maybe most people would say would still say it's a good word processor. But as more and more features were gone, eventually you get to the point where people would say this is no good. So avoiding the patent is something that works some of the time, but you can't expect to avoid them all. Well, you're, you're, you're going to avoid JPEG, you're going to avoid GIF, you're going to avoid MPEG-2. I mean, at this point, you know, what have you got left? <coughs> then there's another option, getting a license for the patent. Well, the patent holders don't have to offer you a license. They can just say, no, I don't want you doing this. I'm stopping you. But some of them will offer you a license, but it may cost. For instance, the patent holder of the natural order recalculation patent is demanding 5% of the gross sales price of every spreadsheet. Now, maybe you could afford that once, but then suppose another patent holder comes with a patent on something else, and another patent holder, and another. What do you do when there are 20 different patent holders, each demanding 
And then patent holder number 21 shows up. Of course, that's a ridiculous scenario. Practically speaking, my friends in business told me two or three such patent licenses would make your business fail. You'd never get anywhere near 20. But there are some software developers that find it painless to get patent licenses. These are the mega corporations, like IBM. IBM published an article in Think Magazine in 1990 about how IBM uses its patent portfolio, which at the time contained 9,000 active US patents. Now it's bigger. Now IBM said it got two kinds of benefits from these patents. One was collecting money. But the other benefit, which it said was perhaps an order of magnitude greater, their words, was getting, quote, access to the patents of others, unquote. Meaning, that IBM uses its patents to force others to cross-license their patents. So IBM gets patent licenses and doesn't even have to pay. IBM can make almost any other software or hardware developer cross-license patents. The mega corporations cross-license with each other and they form a sort of exclusive club up on top of a steep cliff and all the rest of us are down here with no feasible way of getting up there. This is why mega corporations like IBM are in favor of software patents. Because they know that they will own a large fraction of all the software patents. And they will force others to cross license with them. Now if you have a small company, you might think you could do the same thing. But you can't, because you can't get enough patents. IBM can make almost everyone cross-license because IBM has thousands of patents. Each patent points in a particular direction. Right? If I had two patents and one points there and one points there, and now Mrs. Tan points a patent at me and, and sues me, I'm helpless. My two patents don't, don't point at her, so they're useless. Now, IBM has so many patents that they're pointing everywhere. That's why IBM can succeed at making everyone cross-license, but you can't. Now, there is a myth. One of the myths that are used to justify the patent system, and in particular, this has been trotted out to justify software patents. The myth of the starving genius. The myth, said, the, the myth says, suppose that there is a brilliant developer of whatever, who has been working on his own in his attic for years, developing a better design for whatever. And now it's working, and he wants to start producing it and he's going to go into business, so of course he'll be a tremendous success, except for one thing. The big companies will immediately compete with him. They will take all the business away from him, and just because of that, he will fail, and then he'll starve. This is a, a succession of unlikely suppositions. First of all, in high-tech fields, progress is not usually made by somebody working in isolation. It's usually made by people at work in the field, communicating with others. Second, just because our genius is brilliant technically doesn't mean he knows how to run a company. Most new businesses fail within a few years. Probably he's going to fail anyway, just because he's incapable of doing it. But, let's suppose that he does have a talent for business as well as genius. Then, since he's starting a small company, he will probably take advantage of the strengths of small companies and start using these strengths to get the areas of the market that big companies can't.
can't so easily service. And he might be a success. Just because a big company is competing with him doesn't mean he can't keep a small niche of the market, which is enough for a small company to succeed. So he might succeed after all, but suppose he doesn't. Suppose that his business fails completely. If he's this brilliant and this good at, at, at business, he's not going to start. He could surely get a job. So it's a very unlikely scenario. But let's suppose it happens. This, this argument says the patent system will, quote, protect him, unquote. The idea is that he can say, IBM, you can't compete with me because I've got this patent. And IBM says, not again. <laughs> well, that's the myth. The reality is IBM says, oh, you have a patent. How nice. <laughs> well, we have this patent and this one and this one and this one and this one. And they all cover other aspects of the product you are making. So sign a cross-license agreement with us and nobody has to get hurt. <laughs> and our genius, with his, with his understanding of business, realizes he has no choice. He signs the agreement and IBM goes off and competes with him just as if there were no patent system. So patents do not protect, quote unquote, small companies against the mega corporations. <clears throat> it just doesn't work. <clears throat> now, even IBM can't always get a patent license. Because some patent owners don't produce anything except lawsuit threats. <laughs> they don't there's these are the patent pirate companies. Their sole business is to go around threatening those who really produce something and squeezing money out of them. Now, patent lawyers tell us that the patent system is really good for us, but they don't seem to really believe it because they don't let patents apply to their work. There are no patents on how to write a threatening letter. <laughs> there are no patents on how to file a lawsuit or on how to persuade a judge or a jury. So this means that no matter how clever IBM's researchers or lawyers are, they can't get any patents to use to threaten these patent pirate companies. So sometimes IBM just has to pay them. But IBM figures their competition will have to pay them too. So it will just be part of the cost of doing business, and uh, they don't care that much. At the same time, there are some software developers who find it particularly difficult to get a patent license. We, free software developers. And the reason is that a patent license usually requires a payment per copy. And when a program is free, nobody knows how many copies there are. There's no way to count them because everyone is free to make more copies. So if someone offered me a patent license for it with a fee of one millionth of a dollar per copy, the total price might be in my pocket right now. But I can't fulfill this contract because I can't count the copies. And if I restricted people so that I could count the copies, it would not be free software anymore. <clears throat> so this is the alternative of avoiding the patent. Some, sorry, this is the alternative of getting a license for the patent. You can see I'm still a bit sleepy. <laughs> uh, and sometimes you can do it and sometimes you can't. The third possibility is to overturn the patent, prove it's invalid. Now, you, you can only do this when an argument exists. That depends on facts from many years ago, like you know, 
5, 10, or 15 years ago. The only way you can prove a patent is invalid is if you can prove that somebody published or publicly used the same idea at a suitable time before the patent application. So, in effect, the dice were rolled years ago, and if they came out favorable to you, and you can prove that today, then you have an argument with which you could win in court. It'll cost you a lot of money to do so. A lot of software developers don't have enough money. So, even a ridiculous and probably invalid patent can be a very dangerous weapon if it's pointed at you and you don't have the money to go to court. So these are the three possible alternatives, for, three possible options for dealing with each patent. And each one of them may or may not be possible based on independent aspects of the situation, which means that sometimes none of them is possible. And when that happens, your project is dead. But this is not what people do. You see, the penalties for patent infringement are much worse if you knew about the patent. So what lawyers tell you to do is, don't look. Keep your eyes shut. <laughs> make one design decision, and then make another, and another, and another, and another, and another, and another. And you just have to hope you just have to hope that you don't step on a patent. But of course, sooner or later you will. And then it can explode and destroy your whole project. Now, <clears throat> people mostly have a mistaken idea about how the patent system operates. People think you design a product and then you patent it. Not true. They think that you'll patent it and then you'll have the patent on this product. There is no such thing. Because designs for products today involve are rather complicated and they combine many different techniques and ideas. A program will have many different features. Perhaps in the early 1800s, the patent system really did work that way, one patent per product. You would design a new kind of machine and patent it, and, there, and you would have the patent, the one and only patent on that, that machine. <coughs> but it certainly doesn't work that way now. Nowadays, it's quite common that as you are making a new design, you're putting together various ideas that are already patented by others. But how much does this happen? Well, that varies from field to field. Fields of engineering fall on a spectrum. At this extreme, we have the, the myth that most people believe, one patent per product. No field is actually like that anymore. But pharmaceuticals is not that far away. Until a few years ago, it really did fit that myth. It was true for pharmaceuticals, therefore. Because the chemical formula of a drug, the entire chemical formula, would be patented, and that's all. So if you developed a new drug, nobody would have a patent on it already. So it really did work according to that paradigm that's mostly false, but not anymore. Now the field of pharmaceuticals has changed. Now there are broader patents. And today, if you develop a new drug, you may find that somebody else already has a patent covering it. But it's not, it's not too far away. You're not going to find hundreds of different patents covering your new drug. But so, so pharmaceuticals is pretty close to that extreme of the spectrum. And what's the other extreme? Software. Because software is more complex than anything else people design. 
one program will, will do more different things and combine more different techniques and ideas than any physical machine. And why is that? Because in software, we're doing math. We're putting together idealized mathematical components that have definitions. In all fields of physical engineering, people have to cope with the perversity of matter. Matter does what it's going to do. And if it doesn't fit your model, tough. You know, you thought I was going to do this, but I did that. Uh -huh. So in developing software, there are so many problems we don't have to face. For instance, if I put an if statement inside of a while statement, I don't have to worry about whether the while statement will repeat at such a frequency that the if statement will vibrate and crack. <laughs> or that as it vibrates, it will rub away at the while statement and eventually degrade the connection, or that it will eventually just fall out. <laughs> I don't have to worry that it will vibrate even faster and produce radio frequency interference. <laughs> I don't have to worry that the voltage drop through the while statement is so great that the if statement will get too low a voltage and it won't work right. I don't have to worry that uh, corrosive fluids from the environment will get in between the if statement and the while statement and eat away at the connections between them until the signals don't pass correctly anymore. I don't have to worry about how I'm going to dissipate the heat from the if statements through that while statement so that it doesn't burn out. I don't have to worry about how supposing the if statement does crack or uh, fall out or corrode or whatever, how I'm going to gain access to pull it out and put in a replacement. In fact, I don't have to worry about how I'm going to fit the if statement into the while statement each time I assemble a copy of the program. When you're designing a physical product, you have to design it for manufacturability. And often, well, the factory is very, it is going to often cost a lot of money and designing it may be harder than designing the device itself. But when I want to copy the program I've written, I don't have to design a special copier for that program. I have a general purpose copier called CP, and another one called DD, and another one called TAR. You know, each of these things will work on any program. I don't have to design a factory to make copies of my new program. If I want it on CDs, well, I just send a master to somebody. They can, they can make CDs from any sequence of bits. I just have to give them one master copy. So much complexity, so many difficulties that we don't have to face in our field. But the intelligence of software developers is about the same range, I suppose, as the intelligence of mechanical and chemical and electrical engineers. So what do people do if you give them a field that's inherently easier and they have the same intelligence, what do they do? They tackle bigger problems. If you make the problem big enough, eventually it gets hard. So the result is, Engineers in hard fields can only get problems this big, and we, with our easy field, can do much bigger problems. And that means more techniques, more features, more stuff put together in one big program, more different patents infringed by each product. Now, I can suggest that you look at your word processor and look at how many features it has. Each of, as a way, you can estimate how many different ideas are in it. And you'll find hundreds of features, and some of those features are more than one idea. 
some of those features could be infringing multiple patents at once. Like if the word processor can display an MPEG-2 file, that's 39 US patents right there. But now, it's, we don't, we're, we're not limited to speculation. Because about a year ago, a study was done. A lawyer in the US picked one large program, Linux, the kernel of the GNU plus Linux operating system. And he tried to find all the US software patents that, pro that are infringed by something in Linux. And he found 283. 283 patents, each of which covers some technique used somewhere in the source code of Linux. I saw an estimate that Linux was 0.25% of the entire system, which means that by multiplying, we can estimate around 100,000 software packets prohibiting, each one prohibiting a technique used somewhere in the GNU slash Linux system. That is not a precise count. That's a rough estimate. So that shows you what software patents do. They are like landmines for software developers and for computer users, because you see, it's not just the developer who can get sued. The users can get sued, too. And if the patent holder sees that the software developer isn't scared enough, that's exactly what he'll do. He'll start sending threatening letters to the clients. And that's very unpleasant. The solution is clear. Don't allow patenting software ideas, software techniques, software features. Don't allow patents that can restrict what can be done by software running on general purpose computing hardware. There's no need to imitate the U.S. in everything. You know, the U.S. is putting people in prison without trial. That doesn't mean other countries have to do the same. The, the U.S. <clears throat> practices torture. This doesn't mean other countries have to do the same. The U.S. allows software patents. It's not as bad as imprisonment without trial or torture, but it's still a harmful policy. There's no need to do something stupid just because the U.S. does. Can I so, what did you say? Can I change the tape? Sure. Okay. Thank you.